In a competitive job market for junior engineers, only those coming in with the strongest skills will be hired. In this video, I'm going over the top five signs of a self-taught, inexperienced machine learning engineer, so you can avoid these traps and present yourself in the best possible light, whether that's on your resume, in an interview, or your first few weeks on the job. I'm drawing from my own experience mentoring many people on my team at Amazon, as well as several years of experience as a career coach. I'm also semi-self-taught myself, since I come from a non-traditional background and I had to do a lot of up-leveling on my own to get where I am today. So let's get to the list. Before I go into the first sign, just a quick caveat that the term self-taught is a bit loaded. Realistically, whether you went through a formal program or not, the vast majority of what you learn throughout your career will be on the job. So what I'm really talking about here are signs that you haven't been properly mentored or worked on large-scale projects before. It's completely possible for someone with a university degree to also struggle in these areas. Especially sign number one. The first major red flag I see from inexperienced ML engineers is that they only think about the model itself. To zoom out a bit, ultimately your job as an MLE is to solve a problem. A model sitting in a Jupyter notebook is unlikely to accomplish that. I've seen really smart people spend weeks building a model with great offline performance metrics, only to discover that the existing system, for example, couldn't handle the input format, or maybe the inference time is too long. From the very beginning of any project, you should be considering the entire system design. How will this model get deployed? Will it run on a server or a mobile device? How will it receive data? Through batch processing, real-time APIs, or streaming? What happens when the model fails or produces unexpected outputs? These are the kind of questions you should be considering from the very beginning, because they will have a huge impact on what kind of model is even appropriate for the task. But sometimes the biggest system design consideration is whether you even need machine learning at all, which brings us to sign number two. The second sign is jumping straight to the most complex model you can think of. This is a trap that catches a lot of self-taught engineers off guard because they wanna show off their knowledge of cutting edge techniques. But there are so many problems that can happen when you start too complex. You have no baseline to compare against. There's no clear return on investment. It takes way too long to start iterating. The model isn't easily maintainable. It's not explainable to stakeholders and it's much harder to debug when things go wrong. Ultimately, it might even be the case that machine learning isn't even needed for the problem. One of my proudest moments was talking a PM down from building a real time personalized recommendations model to just using a SQL query. That SQL query solved 80% of the business need with 1% of the complexity and development time. So always start simple and get a baseline working. Linear regression, logistic regression, even just heuristics. Then iterate and add complexity only when you can justify it with clear improvements and business value. Speaking of making your work environment support better decision making, let me tell you about something that's been a huge help for my own productivity. This is the FlexiSpot E7 Pro Standing Desk. When you're putting in those long study sessions trying to uplevel your ML skills, being comfortable makes a huge difference. I've recently been recovering from a back injury that was actually caused by sitting too long in a bad position. The FlexiSpot E7 Pro Standing Desk allows me to change positions throughout the day, which has made a big difference in my comfort and recovery. As a bonus, I found that I'm much more focused throughout the day since I'm not just melting into my seat as the hours wear on. The E7 Pro has a 440 pound static capacity for solid stability, a height adjustment range from 25 to 50.6 inches, and features a dual monitor, three stage, semi C leg structure. Plus, it comes with a 15 year warranty and 30 day risk free return service. Having a standing desk has genuinely made a huge difference in how long I'm able to focus and how enjoyable those long work sessions are for me. Check out the link in the description if you want to upgrade your setup and use the code YTE7P50 for $50 off your purchase. Now back to our list. This next one is particularly tough for folks coming from data science, but those with a computer science background can make these mistakes too. The third sign that shows someone is inexperienced is poor software engineering practices. This one is huge because machine learning is still software engineering at its core. And this is where I see the biggest gap between academic projects and industry work. Let's start with testing. Machine learning pipelines need tests just like any software product. Tests and deployment checks need to be run with a CI CD pipeline. It can be something as simple as GitHub Actions, but it's really bad news if someone says they're manually running tests before merging a PR or manually checking a model before deploying to production. Modularity is another big one. Remember at the beginning how we talked about not just focusing on the model itself? Having a single mono notebook is no bueno. We need to write our code in a way that's easy to maintain, extend, and iterate on as an entire system. Speaking of iterating, inexperienced engineers often submit these huge code changes. This is really not ideal. It means it's basically impossible to give a super thorough review, which is extra important for beginners. And you're not getting feedback while it's still easy to make changes. 
That's also just annoying and will make your team frustrated with you. But even with perfect engineering practices, there's still a fundamental step that many engineers either skip entirely or completely overdo, which brings us to sign number four. Sign number four is either skipping exploratory data analysis entirely, or on the flip side, going completely overboard with it. At the beginning of your career, you know you're supposed to do EDA, so you make a whole bunch of plots. Then you review them, but it's almost performative since you're not looking for the right things. We don't need plots for the sake of plots. <laughs> Good EDA should answer specific questions. Do I need to standardize or scale my features? Where are the null values and how should I handle them? Are there obvious errors in the upstream data that I need to deal with? What are the potential data leakage risks I need to watch out for? Most importantly, what kind of model actually makes sense for this problem? Some models have specific assumptions we need to verify. Linear models assume linear relationships. Neural networks need lots of data to work well, that kind of thing. And don't forget about feature engineering ideas. Good EDA should give you insights into how you might transform your features to make them more predictive. The key is being purposeful. Every plot, every summary statistic should inform a decision about how you'll approach the modeling. But even if you do perfect EDA and build a great model, there's one final area where inexperienced engineers consistently shoot themselves in the foot. The final sign is having a poor understanding of metrics, and this one might be the most damaging because it affects how you evaluate everything else. Let's start with the most basic mistake, evaluating metrics on the wrong data set. I've seen people report performance metrics on their test set instead of a proper holdout set, or even worse, reporting metrics on the training set. Then there's choosing completely wrong metrics. The most obvious example in my mind is using accuracy basically ever. Balanced data sets very rarely exist in the real world. If you're working on email spam detection, and 95% of emails are legitimate, a model that just predicts not spam for everything will get 95% accuracy while being totally useless. And also, 99% accuracy should make you suspicious for other reasons. In most real world problems, it usually means one of two things. Either you have that severe class imbalance you're not addressing properly, or you have data leakage, where information from the future is sneaking into your training data. One time, I reviewed a model for predicting customer churn that claimed to have 98% accuracy. Sounds pretty amazing, right? But it turns out they had just accidentally included features that were only available after a customer had already churned. This is really classic data leakage. When we fixed that, the actual performance was around 72% which was still good, but much more realistic. Another huge issue is not connecting your model metrics to actual business metrics. You might have a precision of 0.85, but what does that mean for revenue? How does a 5% improvement in your F1 score translate to customer satisfaction or cost savings? If you can't make this connection, you did not solve a business problem, which is your job. Only checking metrics on a global level is another trap. You need to examine performance across different subsets of your data. Maybe your model works really awesome for users who are 25 to 35, but it performs terribly for those over 65. Maybe it performs well in urban areas, but poorly in rural. These insights are really important for understanding your model's limitations and improving on it. Finally, understand your errors through a qualitative lens as well. Don't just look at the numbers. Actually examine the cases where your model fails. You should be able to explain why your model misclassified specific examples and use those insights to improve your feature engineering or model architecture. I once worked on a model that was performing surprisingly poorly. After doing systematic qualitative error analysis, I discovered the issue was our evaluation data was improperly labeled. The model was right and the labels were wrong. This was because of inconsistent training of the human labeling team, something I could not have possibly found out just from looking at the metrics themselves. These five signs, only focusing on the model, starting too complex, poor software engineering, inappropriate EDA, and misunderstanding metrics are the biggest giveaways that someone hasn't worked on real machine learning projects in a production environment. The good news is that all of these are completely fixable with the right mindset and practice. Focus on solving problems end to end, not just building cool models. Start simple and iterate. Treat machine learning like the software engineering discipline that it is. Do purposeful data exploration that informs your modeling decisions and really understand what your metrics are telling you, both about model performance and business impact. If you're curious about which skills to learn on your way to becoming a machine learning engineer, check out the roadmap video on that that's up next. Thank you so much for watching and I'll see you next time.